Hello there, I'm Reverend Nian, founder of Evolving Enneagram. If you've been seeking a compassion-based, contemplative approach to Enneagram inner work, you are certainly in the right place. This is where contemplation meets the Enneagram. So we're in week 44 of a 52-week Sunday talk series based on the book by Oren J. Sofer, Your Heart Was Made for This. And this week, we're exploring the topic of play. My talk title is Privilege and the Playful Enneagram. So when I mentioned play was happening next week, I know a lot of you are just like, there's some exhaustion going on, at least here in the United States. You know, a lot of times we can feel like a little heavy and burdened by this. So I hope today offers a little bit of a sense of rejuvenation, some more permission to play. So today I'll talk first in part one about privilege and play, the relationship as I see it. In part two, I'll talk about some of the uh, potentially liberating aspects of incorporating play into our contemplative practice. And then in part three, I'll bring in the Enneagram. So let's begin. So I'd like to begin simply by honoring the fact that, that to be able to play is a privilege, or at least it certainly feels that way to me. And it's a privilege that as I reflected on play this week, I felt very blessed that I got to have spaces to play in my childhood. It wasn't always the case, right? Like meaning when I was born in a war, that uh, the hostility and everything that was going on uh, created conditions where, you know, you're not like playing in the streets, right? But we came to the U.S. when I was only like one and a half, and we lived in a cul-de-sac. And I have four siblings. We did not have a lot of money, um, but we had each other. And we'd go down to the end of the street, and there'd be there was this empty lot there, and we'd take sticks and throw rocks and just have fun with virtually no money. And then when we got a little older, it was amazing. I remember my first bike, this um, called Blue Angel. Uh, it was like light blue with clouds and a basket and little tassels. And it was so exciting to like just ride my bike up and down the street with my siblings. My sister had a matching bike and the exhilaration of the wind on my face when we were going too fast and and how as kids we would take our board games that we had again as a matter of privilege we had these board games and we disassemble the pieces and make different houses and areas and go visit each other and we were able to play and there was space to play and my parents uh, allowed for some of that play i mean we definitely did our homework a lot too but but I, I simply want to honor that because recently I watched a documentary on the history of New York City. And there's so much I can say about that. But the one piece that feels relevant for today is that at one point in the history of New York, uh, cars were invented. And when cars were invented, uh, what happened was they began literally to pave over the streets that used to be the places where children played. And in particular, this happened uh, to the disadvantage of the poor, often black uh, populations that were in a certain area of town, the people who themselves, their parents couldn't afford cars. But what was happening is that the uh, wealthier class uh, made these decisions around what was needed, right, uh, for them. And I remember hearing a commentator in the documentary talk about how, for, say, the moms in this area, you know, at the time, the government was like, oh, yeah, you know, we care about you, we're making a difference. And the reaction from the mothers was like, it's hard to believe that you care for our well-being when you don't create these spaces for our children to play and thus to thrive. And it, it just struck me how much I take for granted uh, that in the areas I grew up in, not only could I 
play in the street because I lived in a cul-de-sac, which was closed. There isn't like a lot of traffic that goes through, but there were local parks and playgrounds for us to enjoy as well. And so just thinking about the role of play um, as being related to privilege and then play even having to do with thriving. Uh, and in my research for today's talk, I just happened to think again about recess and how, you know, back in the day when I was in elementary school, recess was a given. And we had a pretty long break, a lunch break and a shorter uh, break in between things. And I read that that's not happening anymore. And because I don't have children of my own, I was kind of out of the loop in this. But how interesting to think that something that created space for a sense of exploration and adventure. You know, this was not PE time, physical education, where we played a specific game. It was like we wander around, we socialize by, you know, trying to make friends and playing in the sandbox and things like that. And so thinking about play and the fact that there's a movement to eliminate recess for kids and thinking about how parents are fighting to preserve this recess or break for kids. And I'm like, what kind of world do we make when we don't have recess? And I'm not just talking about for children now, but what kind of world, what kind of people do we become when we don't have that, that space for play? So I just invite you to consider that for yourself and where you land in this notion. And maybe you might um, be inspired to consider play in a different, from a different perspective today. Moving into part two, I didn't always um, care that much about play, but I believe now that play is essential to our well-being, to our thriving, and play can support us in showing up in the world in a more spiritually liberated way, as well as supporting our social liberation, like social justice issues. Sofer at one point talks about the difference between pleasure in, in like an unhealthy sense of that and the importance of play. He writes, in reality, healthy pleasure is an essential ingredient in everyday life, in spirituality and in social change non-addictive, wholesome pleasure nourishes the heart and strengthens resilience. As we've explored, there is an art to pleasure from pausing for small moments of gratitude to noticing the richness of our sensual experience. What's more, the enduring hard work of transformation depends upon the nourishment of pleasure. And Sofer goes on to say that play can occupy an instrumental and sometimes unexpected role in trans formative activism. In Blueprint for Revolution, Srija Popovich describes how humor can effectively and playfully resist even dictatorship by eroding one of its most essential tools, fear. In Syria, nonviolent activists protesting President Bashar al-Assad began releasing hundreds of ping pong balls in the steep streets of Damascus with slogans like enough and freedom written on them. Each time Assad's security forces were sent, fully armed to chase and capture tiny balls bouncing down the streets. How absurd, right? So kind of the use of like a playfulness to, to bring a sense of like foolishness to, to, what, to these men and what was going on. Another story, in 2012, denying a permit to protest Russian President Vladimir Putin's rigged re-election, a group of nonviolent activists in Siberia held a stuffed animal rally in the town center, the animals holding tiny protest signs. Soon, toys and stuffed animals across the country mobilized and took to the streets to protest, right? So yeah, there's something that the use of humor and playfulness can do to uh, erode like resistance and even fear. And I'd like to say, even from a, a, a 
an inward perspective. You know, when we talk about liberation, this past week was Halloween, and I decided on a whim that I'd create just these little fun Halloween social media posts. Basically, I had a Halloween post that had a gravestone in it that said behaviors that need to be put to rest, right? And then the gravestone has a rest in peace little slogan. And then I did something for each of the numbers for the eight, put to rest, casting spells on people who have betrayed you. For the four, delaying your dreams because you'd rather just keep howling at the moon. Afterwards, it struck me how I could say the exact same thing in a more serious tone. And I believe that it would not be as well received. It wouldn't open the heart. It wouldn't open the mind. Imagine for the eight, if I just wrote instead eights, you should let go of your vengefulness, right? Or your, your desire to retaliate. Like there isn't something that opens the heart there, but hey, eights, you know, put to rest casting spells on people who have betrayed you. And somehow that playfulness and that humor. It's like, oh, okay. You know, there's just a little more openness. And same thing with the four, delaying your dreams because you'd rather just keep howling at the moon. And, and just consider that, like, if I had said something like, well, delaying your dreams because you're sulking, you know, like in the corner feeling sorry for yourself, right? That's like heavier feeling. And so I invite you to consider this sense of playfulness as you engage your own spiritual journey here and really consider that play is about lightening and lightening up. And to that end, I would like to share some reflections on the Enneagram. So thinking about play as enlightening up, I want you, if you're one, to think about this as an attitude and not a structure, right? So that you're not like, okay, here's the game. We're going to play now. Mian invites us to play. So let's do this. You know, it really is an attitude that this like gives some permission to color outside the lines, to bring a little sense of spontaneity and mischief to something without repercussions from your own, um, your own tendency to berate yourself or critique yourself. And so just, you know, bringing some lightness. So for the twos, remembering that play, because, you know, you might like play by creating a craft or doing something artistic. Remember that play isn't necessarily about making gifts for other people. <laughs> so for threes, of course, uh, you just need to remember that play is not about checking off the box, like very similar to the ones. It's just, it's like, okay, Nian's assigned this and I'm going to play a game and I'm going to be able to tell Nian that I played this game this week. I checked off the box and it is much more about um, an attitude toward the moment and bringing some uh, sense of playfulness to the journey itself. So like where last week we had this devoted attitude maybe you want to bring playfulness to the same like relationships or practices that you've been doing whether it's like washing the dishes so for the four uh you might clown around with your moods exaggerate them like like dramatize them in a way where you can see how you already dramatize it but when you do it flamboyantly, there's just, you can laugh at yourself a little bit more and what's going on for you. For the fives uh, who are so afraid of being foolish. So giving yourself some permission to be goofy or foolish in some way to look or to, to behave foolishly can be so good for your soul. And for the six, uh, play involves taking risks. So it's kind of like, oh, yeah, like, let, let's try that. You know, I mean, I'm not saying break the law, but you know, like if it's something little and you just kind of give yourself a little bit of um, opportunity to do something that, you know, your more guarded self may not let you do. Right. So for the seven, making light of something to compulsively avoid your feelings is not what I'm talking about. So being careful because sevens are like, woohoo, play, I can do that, you know, but just being careful that this isn't, think of it as uh, your invitation is to wholehearted playfulness. And what does wholehearted playfulness mean, which is different from play to avoid the heart? 
So for eights, uh, like um, childlike innocence, that's, that's what I'd like to invite you to consider as playfulness, the way that you show up with um, possibly puppies or uh, children. What if you didn't need either of those to show up in the same way? So that's kind of like a playfulness, lighthearted, childlike quality. And then for the nine, you can be a jokester and you're like great at self-diminishing jokes and making funny jokes like at your expense. Um, but but just be aware that those things can actually entrench tight more because it's like reaffirming your sense of self. It's like, I don't matter. Um, and so it's actually, it can be egoic. I'm not saying that, you know, don't ever do it. I'm saying don't limit your sense of playfulness to that kind of humor is all. And instead, I would invite like what we might consider engaged in relational play, where you're really actively involved with others. Maybe, maybe it's like improv or something. And, uh, but where you're activated and engaged, right, with that. So these are just examples. Uh, and again, I want to honor that depending on where you are in your life, that there are different positions of privilege with respect to us even feeling like we have space to play. And especially if we are around people who are not in a place or in a or in a place of lesser privilege. So um, from the book, Black Liturgies, this book here that I highly recommend from uh, Cole Arthur Riley, uh, basically it's a collection of prayers and poems that centers Black interior lives. And Cole Arthur Riley is also the author of the New York Times bestselling book, This Here Flesh. She writes, there's a reason you can't bring yourself to close the laptop, to walk away from your work, to close your eyes. How terrifying might rest appear to a woman who is working three jobs to pay her rent, to those who fear homelessness or hunger or punishment if they do not produce for these toxic systems. We belong to a society that claims ownership over our bodies, that across generations has used our bodies for its own ends. Our petitions for rest cannot be grounded in self-help wellness talks that don't recognize this reality. So this does come from her chapter on rest. And I want to close with a poem prayer by her, by Riley. So I invite you to take a moment to have a seat and close your eyes, even if it's comfortable to do so, to really receive these words, maybe not just on your behalf, but on behalf of all of us, the world that needs rest and rejuvenation and a sense of play to offer space for liberation from the oppression of our system of capitalism and greed. And so this prayer, God of levity, grant us a rest that permeates our waking hours. Mark our days with the recreation and playfulness of our youth. Restore to us the energy for mischief and creativity and competition that we've lost as we've gotten older. Put people in our lives who inspire us in our play. Game nights, karaoke, gardening, film. We want more than the binary of work and sleep. We want delight in the in-between, those moments of interior rest that can happen while we're away. Show us what forms of entertainment and what hobbies lead us into peace and protect us from the lie that if we are awake, we should be working. Remind us that a light heart is not a heart that lacks depth, that our play does not negate our grief. Let us rest in the way we need to today. And amen.